What's up, Benitez Nation? Another podcast, a special podcast today. This one took me a long time to get done, and I finally got them. Uh, today is Wednesday. It's the 30th, the day before Halloween. Uh, things at Columbus are always the same. It's starting to get into a little bit of fall, which I love it. Uh, it's starting to get a little nicer. Um, our football team just made the districts, and we have a couple other sports winning districts as well, and we have a couple sports also starting. I'm uh this is my this is the funnest time, you know, Gabe, at, at the moment, you know, it just I I love this time of the year. Uh there's sports going on every day. There's always things going on in the field or in the basketball courts because basketball's around the corner as well. So I love it out here. It gets to the point that I don't go home until like late at night because I, I just go I just go from game to game, so I really enjoy it. Anyway, uh man, what a what a day today. What a day, right guys? Today we got we got the man, the myth. I mean, I was telling him right now a little while ago. Never met a kid that's ever said anything negative about his class. Uh, he is uh, kind of a little uh, legend or kind of a legacy around here. So, uh, with that, without uh, any uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Osis or just Osis. Hey, uh, thank you very much for bringing me out here. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be a representative of the clan of the Osai here in the great halls of Benitez Nation. <laughs> we are thrilled to be here. We are thrilled to take part in what can only be described as man's great leap versus the small leap that, uh, uh, that Lance Armstrong did as we propel society into greater and greater heights. Oh, you're so good, man. Man, I'm really honored to have you here, man. We've known each other for a while now. We, we, yeah. people, people think that we met each other at Columbus you were at LaSalle for a couple years and then, uh, well, got smart and got out. <laughs> yeah, my stint at LaSalle was short but dignified. Yes, uh, it was. It was a mutually amicable separation. It just wasn't for me. And uh, Columbus offered me a, a, well, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Nice. And, and I've been here, but this is my 19th year here, which means if I would have sold crack on a school zone, I would have been out by now. But it seems not even that will get me out of this place as I approach my second decade here at Columbus. Wow. I, I, I didn't leave LaSalle in the same terms. It was not the same. I, uh, well, it seems I, I, didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't behave very well at the end there for uh, certain people. But I did enjoy my years there. I had a lot of fun, uh, a lot of great kids. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, the other day, uh, my... My, uh, my daughter was telling me that one of, some of my players have podcasts going on. And they were talking about how their old baseball coach, myself, uh, made them cry. And how often did they make them cry? <laughs> they were like, it was just like, and I said, they put that online? And they were, she was like, yeah. They're, they were talking about, oh, he, he made me cry one time when I dropped a fly ball in practice. And, you know, and they're... And, just, well, I, I, I got to admit, you, you fit right into Columbus. I feel like you I hit do. the ground sprinting, not even running. This place, it's as though you belonged here. And I don't think any Columbus baseball player, I'm going to go limb here. I don't think any Columbus baseball player will make a podcast saying how Coach Benitez made them cry. No. At any moment for no any reason. No chance. No <laughs> chance. That's a, a lot different kid over here. It's though. a different population. But I, you know what? I, I just I love it here. I do. I, I love it. I love the kids. I love the administration. I love the faculty. And I, they're just great. Even the even the like the lunch ladies are awesome. I mean, just yeah. I love this place. Uh, I think this is uh, probably the best job I've ever had. I, I don't know about yourself, but it might be up there, right? Well, my my first year here was rough for me. It was a harder transition. I didn't fit in as well. But by year three, I, I got the groove. I found a niche, and yeah, I couldn't imagine working anywhere else. Yeah, man, it was it was all it's 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 an awesome place. I, it's, I just feel like Columbus gets it. They really do. Yeah, and the kids get it, and you you notice it in little moments, like when they were inaugurating the president. Uh, just this past time, this uh, this past mass, not tomorrow's mass, which we're all looking forward to, but the mass before, the assembly before, where the kids just gave the the president a standing ovation, non prompted, not just they sure. just felt it, they got it, they jumped up and they did it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mass is actually Friday because tomorrow we get to behave bad. Oh, that's right true. Right before that's we have true. to behave good. That's true. Okay. All yeah, right. All Saints Day. Yeah. Yeah, we have to behave good. Yeah. Uh, do you remember your old Halloweens? 
I remember some of my old Halloweens. Oh man, you remember the one with the mask, those plastic masks? I you more were than sweating once inside of it. More than once, <laughs> and for me, the night before Halloween was mischief night, where you would do even more nonsense than trick or treating. Exits, you're right. And and plastic masks were a no no because that would be a great way to get plastic shards in your eye. We used to right. It used to get pretty rowdy out there. So, but the Halloween day plastic masks. The other thing I would remember. It was never a big deal to carry a fake gun, like a pretend gun, of like as a military not. guy. Of course not. And that's just something you can't do anymore. I no. remember one year I had a musket. I don't know how I got a musket, but I, I got a musket. I don't know about you. I used, to get, I used to run around my house and get up on the roof and act like I was a guy killing people. Or we were playing cops and <laughs> robbers, and we played uh, cowboys and Indians. Cowboys and Indians <laughs> is something that we did a lot of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if we're even allowed to mention that nowadays. Well, I, I think I think it's referred to as Native Americans now, <laughs> and uh, but still the the premise was the same was reenacting the cultural differences between right. those two populations. I, I'm sure we'll be getting the email soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we'll, 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 we'll get us. So anyway, are you are you a Columbus graduate? I did not go to Columbus. I went to Miami Springs uh, nice. back in the day. I applied at Columbus, but my par- my family was not well endowed. So when we didn't have the money to go, I held a grudge against Columbus. Nice. So whenever I would have swim practice or a swim meet against Columbus, I would throw the Columbus kids clothing in the pool. Nice. Like their Look dry at you. clothes, I would just like kick them in the pool as I would Look go. Look at you. And just little things like that. Like I would I'm worse than you. You know I'm a Belen graduate. Oh wow, okay, yeah, yes, I didn't know that. I, I, yeah, didn't know I, that. I, I am a Belen graduate, which I get hit for every day. Really? <laughs> every day I get hit. You know, I even had brother Kevin one time told me Ask it. Are, are you a, is it true you're a Belen graduate? And I'm like, well, yeah, brother. And he goes, if I would have known that, I wouldn't have hired you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I got through. I right, got right like under. Under the radar. <laughs> I, so, and I don't know if you can say this on Benita's Nation. And if, sure. it, if so, I apologize. I don't think everyone from Belen is a horrible person. Oh. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a tough stance. It's a very, you're in a very I, small, you're in a very small crowd. There are some nice people that came out of there, and I've met a few of them. And, right. And they're okay. You wouldn't have guessed it if you just would have met them and just talk to him? I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm really not, I'm not a typical Belen guy. Uh, I, I, I I don't look like a typical Belen guy. I would agree. You're I, not I, a typical look, Belen guy. I think I that's know. true. I, I mean, I, I know people can't see me right now, but the skull uh, of the uh, the stickers and all that stuff of the logo, I'm starting to look more and more like that guy. That, well, that is not a typical Belen sticker. <laughs> no. Just call it what it is. <laughs> As atypical for the lead. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> that's a great introduction. Let me ask you something. So tell me a little bit about your history. You, you already told us about Miami Springs, uh, college, uh, marriage or marriages. Nowadays, you never know. You never know. You never know what's going on. Uh, I can imagine, you know, you were probably, you probably been desired by many, but but you, but only <laughs> one took you out. So it's, it's a funny story how my, my life runs backwards. Uh, on... I was 14 years old and I had I was always the kind of guy that would go to parties and talk to every single girl at every party oh, just kept hoping swinging. to get lucky just kept some, swinging. someone's gonna care enough to be okay That's with me smart. and I would meet people and m- most of the times nothing would work out but I ended up meeting someone who knew someone who knew somebody else oh, boy. who ended up knowing this girl who went to Carrollton and to me, a Mammy Springs boy, Carrollton. I can't afford Columbus. Wow. And there's a Carrollton girl? Yeah, that's, ooh. So, so she had a birthday coming up. It was her 15th birthday. So I was like, oh, no, we got to do something. So I was like, I'm going to get a card. I'm going to convince my brother to drive me down to this girl's house. I'm going to give her a card because she was having a girl's birthday party. You know how those things are. Oh, boy. So I was like, we're going to totally do this. I'm going to go in, cold call, knock on the door, never seen each other, and say, hi, you know me. She's going to fall in love with you right when she sees you. She's, it's going to be like a, it's like a Hallmark movie. So I go, I knock on her door, I hand her the card, and uh, she comes out, she reads the card. She goes, look, you can't come in. She was gracious. She went back into her car, into her house. I went into the car with my brother. And I go, I look at my brother, and I was like, hey, you know, I think I'm going to marry that girl. Not a boy. And so my brother punched me dead in the face. <laughs> called me an idiot. Which is a probably very good reaction to that statement. But, oh, that's good. But it's true. I, I mean, we didn't date the whole time. We saw other people. You know, we... We, we did make sure we made the right choice with each other, but we ended up marrying each other. Wow, slowly you, you worked it down. Well, I was like a fungus. I grew on her, and then you just can't scrape it off. It's wow. just, 
No matter how hard you try. If, I, I don't know her, but she's a Carrollton girl. I'm sure she's a good woman. You, so, she is. She's so, a, I, I swung out of my league right yeah, there. Yeah, you probably out-punted the coverage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You, you just went, went out I there. mean, she's an attorney by trade. Oh, wow. She went to Tufts University, which is one Great of those real school. schools. Right. Was that Pittsburgh? It, well, it's in Massachusetts. Massachusetts, sorry. And, right. and, and she went to Boston College for law school, and she's a smarty pants. Is she, wow, this is, she loves it up there, huh? Yeah. Like she likes cold weather or something? No, <laughs> no. It's the second she was done, she moved back here. Ah, the boy. So, uh, kids? Three kids. Three. I have a 15-year-old boy who is somewhere right now on campus wondering where his dad is. Oh, that's all right. Uh, deciding whether or not he should hide from me long enough so he doesn't have to do homework or if he should actually, I don't know, get something done. Oh, my money's on I remember hiding. remember those days. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. God. I remember when I had my son here, it was always a mission. Thank God that he was a baseball player, so I was able to find him. But, <laughs> you know, but he's at practice. But then practice will be over, right? And then all of a sudden, I'll, I'll be I'll be in the office for a little while talking to Webb, and then I come out and I'm like, "Where's Ochi?" And I right, can't. Right. Where's o hey? Where's Ochi? And everybody's right. like, "I don't know." And be a brother Herb's all the way down here. Well, you know. I, I got a couple of apps that track him at all times, and plus I have one of those chips you put on a dog underneath the scruff of his neck, and that. There you go. I never thought about that'll that. That'll get stuff. him going. That'll yeah. get him going. So, so you have three kids, uh, a beautiful wife, uh, a wife that obviously uh, has made very really good decisions, and maybe well, just one bad one. She made one really, 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 really. She was young, and I got her before she was looking, and yeah. you know. <laughs> Every time she would meet someone, I would mention all the bad things about that person so that oh, she, you know. So you do like a little bit of guerrilla warfare yeah, on it. You just, yeah, yeah. Look, you got to, uh, you, you've got to paint the field and propaganda your you way through things. You don't play fair when, no. it, when it comes to love. There's no love fair. Love and war. There's love, no fair. Love and war. There's no it. fair. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, do you, um, you know, the whole point of this podcast is, is, is history. We're trying to promote history. Um, were you? Did you like history in high, in high school? So I liked history more once I got into college, and then I fell in love with history even more once I had this. I no longer had to memorize dates. Right. Once I was past that, I fell in love with history because right. uh, nothing makes me understand my world better than the past. Right. Uh, so even as simple as uh, I remember, and this is going to sound like a long time ago. Uh, 2016 not, not during the me. during me. No. during the presidential uh, run-ups of this past presidential run-ups, <laughs> yeah. it people were describing it as the most divisive time in American history, and I'm not even sure we were in the top ten. Like, oh uh, no, civil rights was 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 pretty divisive. Uh, the the labor riots back in the 1800s, I think it was the 1800s, sure. was, was kind of rough for us. Uh, civil War, we could mention that yeah. one as a Andrew Jackson was a divisive person uh, just by himself. Andrew Jackson and and. <laughs> His almost impeachment, which right, the, the, he fired his whole cabinet twice. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it's it's always interesting when I can go back and look at uh, look at things in context of time yeah. and, and see that maybe well yes it is divisive is this the most no I, no it's no what is near. your favorite part of history so uh, my favorite time in history is right after World War One nice. leading into World War Two. And uh, the reason why is because I feel like every nation mm -hmm. that plays a role in that time period is being run by a completely insane person. Just someone who's currently on fire and is running in a circle oh. with crazy ideas. Right. Even, and, even, the, even the good side or the bad side, they're all a well, little even, bit crazy. Even Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was a madman. He was. And... And maybe an intellectual madman. Maybe that's what it takes to get through these impossible times. It's crazy people. But right. he was crazy. Mussolini was crazy. I'm not even touch the crazy of Adolf Hitler. Sure. The Japanese emperor was crazy. Roosevelt was crazy. Stalin was a little Stalin bit. Stalin was extraordinarily <laughs> crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Actually, uh, so so you like talking about that time. That time is 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 well, we shame the Germans. Uh, we ba basically blame them for the whole world war, which uh, allowed uh, what the Nazis to kind of grow inside of it. And you know what? I, if you look at the Nazis, 
uh, they had a Germany first approach to make it to simplify it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not just Germany first. They had a lot of other things going on, but they were trying to bring about national pride with the Germans, which yes. is something that they were lacking, like you said, because right. they were shamed. They were, you rubbed their face in the dirt right. and they were saying, listen, we deserve better. Right. And that was something that resonated with people. And I wonder, even with myself and with my current time, how often is it that something, a message like that could resonate with people even today? And you see it yeah, today. I agree. Where if, if you have a group of people who are down and downtrodden and you give them a voice and you give them some form of importance that you matter enough, all of a sudden they, they will be loyal to you. They will be fiery and loyal to you. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's absolutely right. I mean, uh, obviously, I don't, want to, I don't like talking politics too much, but what's going on right now is just... I just don't see what the positive is as far as... Well, the, the, if you on. ever look for positive, the positive would fall into something like being prideful of being an American. Sure. And there is pride in that. And there is and something... And I've been brought back a little bit more, I think. Yeah, and there is, and there is stuff to that. The, just like everything else in life, nothing is all bad. Okay, e correct. E even some things are uh, have good to them. And, correct. And I kind of like the idea of you know you can be proud of your country and proud of where you're from and right. look out for your own and that's okay right but 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 also being part of this country is being able to accept the differences between all yes of us, yeah which is that what what I think is actually really it, it's it's really I mean I've never I've never seen it so so heated as it is now I mean uh, people can't wear a stupid red hat in public or you can't uh, give your opinion about almost anything. Well, and and you're ta we're talking we're both relatively young, so in our young sure. lifetimes, this is true, you know. And going back to that World War One to World War Two time, if you spoke against Stalin's Russia, oh boy. if you wore a non-pro Russia, non-pro Soviet Union at that point, sure, uh, you would have been treated more than badly. You'd have been imprisoned. Right. You know, and if you go back to the civil rights time, there were people who were imprisoned for their thoughts, people who were investigated by the federal government right. as being possibly anarchists or people trying to overthrow the government. Yes. Or you go back to the McCarthy times where they think you're a communist if you thought the wrong things or with the wrong groups. Yeah, that, that, that was crazy. It, it's, McCarthyism was so absolutely a black eye in America. Relative to that, not wearing a red hat and getting dirty looks, I'm not sure if it's that divisive i get i get it and i will defend someone's right to wear whatever hat they feel like yeah, they need to okay, wear who cares but I mean, that being said it's it's uh the reaction that most people are getting while it is unpleasant it is not outside of a normal range of reaction yeah w with that said i mean do you so do you think at, at the time between the two wars those um I said you. I think you said kind of uh, unbalanced uh, leaders. Were they necessary? Well, I I don't know if they were necessary. They were there. They were present. Well, sure. And then uh, it's as though the the war left an imbalance in each of these places that yes. was reflected in the people mm -hmm. and reflected in their in their leaders. And and I don't have any reason to believe that. I don't have any direct evidence to say. Well, look at this imbalance and. But right. it just seemed weird that a, I feel like a group of people who are in balance will not vote a balanced person into power. Don't get me wrong, Soviet Union is not a voting process. No. But, uh, but in Germany, there was a pseudo voting process, sure. a somewhat voting process that right. did bring, and in Italy, there was a, a somewhat democratic process. I don't know how clean it was, to be fair, but. Well, I mean, the fascists did everything possible to keep themselves in power. Yes. You know, uh, they, they, you know, yes, there was voting, but I'm sure they, there was a lot of strong arming. Yes, and I'm there sure. there was a lot of intimidation, which, you know, that's, an, that's another thing that I, I feel that even today, it, there's a little bit of that stuff going on under, under our feet, which I don't really appreciate it. I really... It's unnecessary and unhealthy to a thriving democracy. I agree. It, it, and it will undermine democracy more than the outcome of any one election sure. is the suppression of the electorate. Yeah, out of those characters, uh, or maybe or any other character, is there any historical figure that really catches your attention or you feel some kinship with? Well, kinship, no. I, 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 they're, they're nuts. 
So, <laughs> well, you have to be to, you know, you, you, to, to actually reach to the point in which you are remembered by history. There, there has to be some kind of uh, a, a difference in your mode. Yes, uh, you know, you, there's you, there is no walls for you. You got to be know. a rare kind of apple. Yes, uh, the so I enjoyed learning about the rise of Hitler in Germany. I enjoyed uh, learning about. Uh, how, because I, I, I remember growing up and in, in high school learning about how Jewish people were treated in Germany, no. but you didn't hear much about how they were treated in, in the USSR at that time. And it was just as bad or just worse. Just as bad, absolutely. It's just, I mean, it, it was, a, it really was a group of people who were not just, I had no home, they were unwelcome in anyone else's home. Right. In anyone else's backyard. And so hearing about how these different worlds these different countries on the same world, I guess, these sure. uh, these people uh, existed on the same planet right. at the same time. And then how America, which was isolationist in a, in a major way, just gun shy after World War One, seeing how that just did not work out. Uh, yeah. And yet... Trench warfare did not and, work. And yet they were dragged into it, you know, with, with their not, I guess, an unwillingly drug into it with Pearl Harbor. It was... It's just fascinating to see how these leaders then tried to message and reach their people to get them to a consensus of where they wanted to go. Right. And it's not like they knew what the end, like we know the ending of the show. Sure. So, but when they were living it, there must have been a sense of trepidation when Churchill said, all right, Poland's been attacked. We're going to go fight Germany. Right. I mean, understand when Churchill uh, uh, declared war on Germany, they hadn't attacked the United Kingdom. They attacked Poland. Yes. And 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 and, and, and that the was lands enough. that they felt were theirs. Right. From the beginning, the Dutch land that they, which they they asked for, they they wanted back. And then France jumped in too when Poland went down. And I found that to be interesting because here we are declaring war against a country that did nothing directly to us. They were right next to them. But right, but it was close enough, right? Close it was enough. close yeah. enough and it and was And the scary Russians enough. allied with them at the beginning and yes. then Stalin turned around on them and just well, I mean, more I mean, how many Russians died in World War II? I think it was 20 million. It was it? more Russians than Americans and, in every war since the Civil War. It is, <laughs> right. It's just it's, yeah. it's just ridiculous. How about American history? Do you like American history? So, I my favorite, and this is what I spent the summer on. I'm this kind of nerd, where uh, <laughs> I sat and I listened to Thomas Jefferson, sure, Theodore Roosevelt. I was doing the uh, Mount Rushmore. I was doing George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Jefferson, and Roosevelt. Yeah. And the most fascinating one that I I cut early, and I want to get back to is Theodore Roosevelt. I don't understand how that man was so popular and so like beloved and yet i know he was so popular and so beloved like i'm trying took to on big business uh he, he was a progressive uh there but you're right i mean uh he even like uh started a a, a revolt uh, he wanted the panama the panama canal right and he basically uh weaponized the panamanians for independence against colombia and right. then said well you want to pay me back and the, they had the canal. <laughs> I, I I followed his history before he was elected president. Like I followed his youth and growing up, and he was a relentless. You want to talk about people who never give up? Yes. Like he was a sickly child, and he never gave up. He would constantly wrestle people, even though he was a sickly child. He boxed against champions. He boxed against people. He would go hunting for months on end. Never stop talking. Oh. And, and, <laughs> he talked all the time, and he and the way he enunciated his peas, he would pop the peas really whenever he would speak. I didn't know, that. and he would like cut them so that it would resonate. Yeah, I, I see them. Like sometimes you see in those uh, clips in which they, you hear him talking, and you see him talking. He had so much energy. He, I mean, it's he, crazy. he's considered the most athletic president of all the presidents. I well, I I wouldn't doubt that at all. I I can't think. I mean, of the presidents that I know of, and I don't even know half of them, like, well enough to know how athletic they are. He's far and beyond any of them. And think about it. He probably, I don't know if anybody would have remembered him if uh, McKinley doesn't get killed. That's how he takes over. Yeah. McKinley is yeah. killed. He's the vice president. I don't even think McKinley likes Roosevelt. They, they put Roosevelt as a VP because everybody basically knows that the VP is a position of basically 
nothing. Right. It's almost kind of a nothing burger position. And they put him there because he was very vocal. He was very aggressive. And they thought we'll put him in VP. Well, and even kidding. in the Senate of uh, the of New York Senate, not even the National Senate sure. in New York, he was such a mover of people. Right. He just got people to follow along with him. And usually, when you get an athletic guy, you don't think of them as like great orators. Right. But well, he, was he really artist. was. And I so I feel like I'm on. I when I stopped, the summer ended. Right. I had, we had to come back to work. So sure. when I stopped, right. I was at the cusp of what I thought was going to be the big breakthrough right. onto the national stage of Theodore Roosevelt. Right. He was going to win some elections and. And I have that audible book. I mean, for me, there for, for me, me, it's 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 always gonna, it's always going to be Washington. Uh, I, mm. I I I do not believe that our country would look the same way uh, without Washington. Uh, he uh, he was incredible. Obviously, he was very important in the revolution. Well, itself. yeah, yeah. And then he's the president of the Constitutional Convention to make the Constitution. He becomes our first president. We don't have all the details on what the executive branch is, and he himself has to fill in all the gaps from all the cabinet members to all the powers of the executive order, of the executive power. Uh, you know, he does all these things. And then after two terms, humbly says enough. Right. You know, and, and he could have stayed forever. Uh, he could have stayed until his death. And, and he didn't. Um, I was telling the class the other day that after the American Revolution, he, um, he is... At the end of the war, at the end of the revolution, he actually asked African Americans, uh, you know, slaves and, and, and free men, free blacks, uh, working, uh, fighting. And he is so taken back by their courage and their, I mean, just they're, they're such great soldiers and they're so courageous and they're so wonderful that when he gets back to Mount Vernon, he releases all his slaves. Huh. Yeah. So at that point, from that point on, all the people that actually worked on it, on his on his lands were actually workers, paid workers. And that's that's something I like. I've never heard about that. With, well, that's what this George was. For, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yeah. And, and that would not have been a popular position in his time. Oh, no. That was that was very much against the trend of slaves or slaves or slaves. Actually, I, w I read something the other day that when, after he dies in 1799, December 1799, he actually, uh, when they actually go into his library, over half of his books are on uh, abolition. Really? Yes. Huh. So he he knew that this was coming. So not only and he welcomed it. Not only was he ahead of his time in creating the country, creating a because look, we have a hard enough time filling a cabinet with positions that are already announced, named, and described. Right. He had to he make, had to make it himself. Make it himself. So he did that. He he had the foresight to see himself to not run for right. a third term, and. He was ahead of the curve on abolition. That's yeah. I would say that's a pivotal person. I mean, you got to think country. his his fingerprints are all over this country. And you would say, I mean, I think you would you would admit to this. This is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, country in world history. Oh, it is. It you is. know, from our from our democratic ideas to our republic go our republic government uh, to just. I mean, look at we're we've been in wars and and we don't even feel it. We we can sit in an afternoon and talk about the good and the bad and the ugly of the United States Correct. without fear of persecution or pos or prosecution sure. or bodily harm. Right. And that's the greatness of this country. It even allows, I mean, like, I know everybody talks about, well, there's socialists and this and that, but our country's so great that even socialists have a voice. Right. You know, not that I am a voice for socialism. Right, right. Not right. at all. I'm being Cuban. I'm Cuban. So, right. <laughs> so are you, right? So, yes. We've seen it. Yeah, that's not that's not even an option for us. But, but I, I, would, I would rather live in a place where they have a voice. Correct. Than live in a place where they don't. Correct. It gives it opportunities for all people. And, and, and they have the right. Even if I don't welcome it or even if I don't agree with it, but it's allowed. Um, so, you know, a funny thing to talk about slaves. Um, I was I haven't gotten to this part with my class, but uh, you know Robert E. Lee. There's a whole thing going around with Robert E. Lee, and it's right. not. You know what people don't realize that Robert E. Lee, right before the Civil War actually began, he actually uh, released all his slaves. I see. Okay? But you know who did have slaves at the end of the war? Ulysses S. Grant. Right. The actual the, the actual victor <laughs> of, well, the, of the I, of the I, Civil War. And I and I don't know. This is more of a question than a statement. Sure. Okay? I, I've always wondered if the Civil War had less to do with abolition and more to do with 
uh, maintaining the union of the states? Or was it the other way around? Was it more about abolition and less with the continuity? Well, for Abe, for Abe Lincoln himself, I mean, he just basically just said, you know, and they, they get to the point, he gets to the point that he says, if I would have known this was all going to happen, I would have. Right. I, I would have, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone this way. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure everyone regretted the war. Sure. W once it happened, because yes. it, it's a great idea until it's the blood and treasure and that's on the ground is your own. Then it, then right. it's it's different. No one expected it was going to go as long as it did. Right. Or it was going to be as bloody. I mean, more more Americans died in the Civil War than the American Revolution, World War One, and World War Two put together. Right. And and it was it was a fight over. And and I'm I'm sure scholars will go back and forth with this. Sure. It was either a fight for abolition or the the main the maintenance of the union of the states. Sure. And and there might have been better, easier ways to get both of those things done. Right. That didn't require so much. Well, you can tell what Abraham Lincoln is doing when 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 uh, Lee actually surrenders in Appomattox. The the terms are more than favorable to the South. Right. It's basically put your guns down, go back to your homes, we'll give you a horse, you can keep your side guns, right. your side your handguns, and and you can uh, we'll give you three days of rations to get back to your town. Right. You know, it, which is uh you can, it's obvious he wanted to 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 mend as soon as possible. Right. Well, cuz you're fighting with yourself. Correct. You're fighting your 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 right hand is fighting your left. Right. And even though and even hand. though many people it was very unpopular. Right. You know, it was very unpopular like just like the civil war was very unpopular coming in, but uh he just didn't uh he just he's a man of his principles. You I know, mean, and it's funny cuz I I just heard this thing with Andrew Jackson, right, who came in right after Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I so Andrew Jackson and uh, Andrew Johnson came after Lincoln. Andrew Jackson was before. Okay, then it was Johnson. I okay, apologize. Johnson. The Andrew Johnson. The Reconstruction. And during Reconstruction was Andrew Johnson was the one that was almost impeached. Yeah. So Andrew Johnson, right <laughs> after the votes. war, right after the one war, one or two votes. It, it was one vote one after vote. the war. Uh, he was against abolition. He was like, he was not progressive in any stretch of the imagination. Not at all. Another one of those VPs where he was just a VP by title. No one ever thought he'd actually and do something. And by territory. Right. Because he was a southerner. Right. So he was trying to get some of that vote. And then he's now president and uh, they're trying to do reconstruction. And one of the conditions of reconstruction was the South had to have elections that were monitored by the military to make sure they were fair. Right. And uh, so Johnson wants to fire the the wartime Secretary of War mm -hmm. so that the military won't go there. Right. So then Congress tries it's to block just, that's that. Stanton. Right. Stanton was the guy's name. I Correct. can't believe you remember this. You're, I'm a history teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so so the so uh, then the like uh, the the House tries to block that. And Stanton's like, I'm not leaving, or the Senate, and Stanton's like, I'm not leaving, and it's just back, and it's all coming off of the war. We just finished killing each other, right? and now we cannot lead each other at this point. Well, so, that, so what happens is the, the Congress actually votes uh, that no cabinet member can actually be fired without the approval of Congress. Right, right. And then he turns around and fires Edwin Stanton. Right. And, and then, of course, the impeachment begins. And, and that was, that's just, I just can't imagine the bravery of people on all sides oh, yeah. wading through that kind of chaos where it's just, right. I, I can picture like, like bar, like bar room fights oh, breaking sure. out in the middle of Senate floors. That happened during Johnson's time. There, <laughs> right. there was actually a, there was actually a, a uh, there was a, a South, a South Carolinian. No, there's there's one guy that was making fun of one other congressman because he had some kind of a lisp or something, and his his nephew finds out about it, walks into the Senate with a cane and beats him <laughs> and beats him to the point in which the, that congressman is not able to come back for another two years <laughs> for rehabilitation. I just can't. Can you imagine? Right. The, right. The, he just beat the snot out of the guy. And this is this is in our Congress. And that happened right <laughs> in our Congress. Right. Yes, by another congressman. Right. So, I mean, and I know, and from my understanding, part of the reason why Johnson was not uh, removed from office, which is the second part of impeachment,
right. was uh, because of a series of under back room, underhanded bribery oh, kind of back and forth, sure. which was more common in that day than it, than it is today. At least more open in that day than it is today. Right. And it's just amazing to me sure. that we made it through that time. Like oh. we're okay now. Oh yeah, and we think this is bad. And this and we're this is good. And we think we're this fine is bad. with it. Well, I'm good with this. Yeah, it's just <laughs> I'm good. Uh, with this. I mean, at least no one's like beating each other up in like, Congress. I would not. I would not want to see a president be murdered. That's something no, I never want to see in my no, lifetime. That's horrible. I would not want to see the Congress then impeach the vice president. Somebody get beaten with a cane in the <laughs> Senate, <laughs> and then we're gonna follow that up with some bribery and call it a day. Yeah, like, yeah I think I'm good. I well, think I'm good. I, I mean. Even Abraham Lincoln, the day he dies, and there's there's another guy called Seward that gets uh he gets stabbed several times. Like the it's, same. It's it, wild. It was it was. It was it's a wild time. It really was a wild time. Uh, one of the things I, I I'm a little caught up. Most people don't know about Abe Lincoln during the war, during the Civil War. He actually uh, did not allow habeas corpus. There was no fair trials. He was he would uh, he he actually uh, uh, took it out. Just got rid of him. Got rid of him during the war. Okay. They said there were just, these are military arrests, and there is no habeas corpus. There is no. We're going to suspend that. We're going to suspend it. Can you imagine uh, either this or, president or, or, the any, more, or the last president or the last president? Any of them just can, deciding? Can you, yeah. We're you just know gonna, what? We're just gonna just gonna lift. We're gonna let that slide. We're just gonna let it go. I mean, I would say George <laughs> W. Bush with the with the fight versus Al Qaeda came close. Yes. But I don't know if he went all the way. Even he had the military tribunals and the yeah. and the courts. Even if they were one sided and. With that said, what? How do you think people history going to remember our time? That's an imp well. That's an impossible question for me because okay. I bet you no one in the time of Andrew Johnson thought we we're going to be talking about the cane beating. Right. They, right. <laughs> they were like, "Well, that was like yeah. that was page twelve on the bottom fold." Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah I, I just I I think I think people are going to say, "Wow, what what wonderful opportunities those people had, and they didn't really take advantage of certain things." Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I think our country, uh, I think most people are somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And I think most people can agree on many things across the board, but I think it gets lost. I, I think it gets lost by the, by the, 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 the very opposite fractions. Right. You know, the ones that are very, the, 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 just the extremists on both sides. One of the things I try to tell my students is stay away from the extremes. Right, you know, because that's not where most people are. You, you know, and I and I wonder if this is a piece of it. Uh, if you lived in Ukraine, you've been living with under the auspice of Russian propaganda for decades. Correct. You've heard Russian lies every day, and after a while, it's like that kid in the class that you know is lying because he's lied a hundred and fifty times, and of course he's lying now. Sure. We have not had that. Uh, pleasure condition I'm not even sure what to call it right so now when we're getting lied to on a large on a large scale and on a consistent basis like propaganda does I'm not sure we as a country are so good at picking out those lies it's not like Canada has been feeding us lies and Mexico has been feeding us lies no. for generation after generation no. and we've been forced to like sift through it and, I get it. It, and it's not that we're dumb people because I don't think Americans at whole are dumb in any way shape or form no I think it it's a matter of getting used to uh, the skeptical mindset I think if you go right now to to Russia and you gave Russians a lie I feel like they would be less likely to believe it because they've been lied to by their country on such a regular basis Correct. that they're not going to believe 90% of what you say without good honest proof and even then right but I wonder how much of, of Americans actually have that threshold of I'm gonna believe you I'm gonna think you're lying 99% of the time until you prove me wrong I, I right until you prove me well said until right you prove me wrong prove uh, you're lying prove me wrong right so for some reason I, I think that the, the new way of doing things is just letting everything out there and then that people cut it down, and then you think that whatever does not get chopped into bits, you you put those things together. And you say, well, there's the truth. 
Right. And, and I think that's a real problem. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a dangerous one because yes. the only way a democracy works is with an educated electorate, an educated and engaged electorate. Which is the reason why we had the electorate. Right. The electoral college. Right. In order to get the engagement and the education of the people who are voting, it, it's it's paramount. Right. But if if misinformation gets equal weight as information, and yeah. it, and it's not met with a skept skeptical enough ear and eye, right. I feel like it's easy to fall into a rabbit hole, even if you are an ultra more intelligent than the average American. Sure. Because this is not, misinformation generally does not attack the mind, it attacks the will and the heart. Um, let me ask you a question. What do you think what's going on with the Constitution now? There's a lot of people that are starting to really poke at the Constitution and feeling that the Constitution is maybe not correct completely, uh, you know, that you can add, even though the Constitution has been added, amendments have added, Amended, so we've made mistakes. Amendments have been added, and that's how it's supposed to be added. Correct. And uh, so uh, I think that, well, there's two words for it, and they escape my mind. I know Anthony Scalia was a strict interpreter of the Constitution. Big time. And I don't remember what the name of it is. I'm going to call it a fundamentalist, but I don't remember what the name of it is. Fine. Uh, and then there's people who treat the Constitution more as a guiding path than an actual, you know, uh, doctrine to Ultimately, be used that's what we're word for right word. Not, right. That's exactly. See, that's, that's what like, I asked the question because not everybody picks up on that. Some people sometimes will say, well, the Constitution was perfect. It's lasted this long. It obviously is uh, perfect. It's exactly where it needs to be. And there's others that say, no, it's completely wrong. We need to, you know, it's like, almost like the Articles of Confederation. We need to erase it. We need to start all over. But can you imagine? I, so I, one of the things in the Constitution is anything that's not written in the Constitution is left to the states. Correct. Nothing that's federal. If it's not federal, if it's not addressed federally. That's actually one of the Bill of Rights. It's, 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 it's left 10, to the states. It's a 10th Bill of Rights. So it's, if that's the case then I know if I disagree with some aspect that's not exactly explicitly written in the Constitution, I could take it up with my state legislators yes. and change that rule law if I so decide. Right. And if there's something in the Constitution that I and the people in my country so strongly believe in, right. equal rights amendments or the, the right for women to vote or anything like sure. that, we add an amendment and we can do that. And that's still possible even in this somewhat divisive time because there are some things like you said that we fully agree on how about divisive how about women were not allowed to vote till 1920 slaves native everyone could vote before women could vote that's that's absolutely crazy. and you know, and and ironically we had a a african-american president before we had a female president <laughs> and i and i'm i'm not sure now I'm still right, waiting for a hispanic one too right well i mean you might have to hit the clock a little longer because i'm not sure how this one's going to work out <laughs> i absolutely agree with that i don't think we're going to be seeing one anytime so, soon uh and i wonder like in senate and in the house of representatives and mayorals how often you get an african-american before a female because uh, i i think I think the order of things matters in terms of a society. Yes. Not so much in terms of like your household, but in a society, it does matter. I, I, I think I agree. You you address what you think is most important first, most uh, most eminent, most problematic, most now. Right. So, I think there's something to be said for women to that it it took that long and. We, I was sitting in the car yesterday. I was playing Spotify and I was playing m music from 1920. Really? And Spotify's got music from 1920 because I've never heard 1920s what, music. What music did you hear? Well, so. Uh, uh, it's not Cap Calloway, so that's, that's there way was, after. There, well, t artists and titles, way out of there. But it was a, 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 a barbershop quartet. It was, uh, there was a song from the Suffragettes about women's suffrage which opened up the conversation of what women's suffrage was and stuff and right. one of my daughters knew about it the other one didn't so it was nice to be able to bring why, that up why is it that no one ever talks enough about eleanor roosevelt she was incredibly important for women's history uh, history of women here in america well i can say it in, in a sentence men write his, history books that's correct so why would eleanor if if, if a man my was God. never taught about eleanor roosevelt why would they add that to a history book 
I, I don't, that's well, well said. I mean, that's the reason why these sort of things don't. I don't mean, I think th I think things are starting to change. We're starting to see more women in history. That yes, we're starting to see and even in our history books. You're starting to see them recognize. It's not just the seductress. You know, Cleopatra. Even RBJ. Or the crazy Joan of Arc. You know, that, that's like they always have to represent uh, a woman that is, uh, you know, um, a, a, a great warrior almost with uh, male attributes. Right. Or a seductress. Well, well even Ruth Bader Ginsburg now. Oh, who, who, who is woman. completely broken out of a popular shell and now is something that my kids know who they are oh yeah and, and the who she is and yet she is neither masculine nor seductress no she's just like she's she's just no. she she will argue against the most powerful men in the world with a whisper and win yes and and she has power in the words she chooses not in her delivery of the words right i respect i mean i always respect the, the title of her i mean she's been there for so long yes you know i i feel sometimes and 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 you know i i don't always agree with uh, some of the supreme court justices but she's been under attack a lot by by one side and i just feel that's a little it's a little I, harsh so i don't i i really agree with a, a supreme court decision me too mostly because i don't feel like the supreme court should be deciding some of the things they decide i feel like some of those things should be left to the states or left to legislators right. or left to somebody else but i mean they're there they're asked to do it so they do it yeah they, they, they've been like now that the marijuana thing is they really come up front and i don't right. know what the you know but, it's federally not allowed but states allow it and Everybody's confused on what's that, going on. That should be a legislative. If we can get past, you know, trying to impeach each other and investigate each other and fight each other and hate each other, right. that would be a nice thing to be able to talk about and I, cover and do I some saw, research. I saw a special on. the other day. I think it was on sixty minutes. They were talking about in California how how marijuana is not producing as much money as they thought it was, and they have all this excess marijuana, and it's actually being somehow leaked into other states even states that do not oh uh, yeah it's well yeah just because they need to they need to it. move it yeah they need to move it which is uh, wow yeah it's just you know that is crazy yeah it's just so I, I i always look i find it all fascinating i find all these things about history and all these concepts and you know all these great characters and all this stuff i, I find it incredibly interesting um well, I'm not going to keep you too long because we're already at man, we're already at 48 minutes. It goes pretty fast. Time flies it? when you're having fun here. Yeah, I, I, I I want to I wanted to make this statement for all of your listeners, for anyone who hears this podcast. Sure. Every so often, a boy will come up to me and say, "Osis Nation, Benitez Nation," as though there's some kind of competition. <laughs> When you look at an elephant and you look at a peanut, there is no oh, weight competition. Look at that, man. Okay, we are we are officially uh, the clan of the Osai would like to make it official out loud for everyone to know. We as a province would like to apply for statehood <laughs> within Benita's nation. We'll talk. I'll talk to my committee. We I will, think we can get that done. We will even accept a protectorate status where we will be at your beck and call to defend <laughs> you for any reason at any time. I feel like Cyrus the Great. I mean, I got, I got, I got, I got, a, I got conquering uh, warriors added on to us. We, but there. <laughs> There was no Osis Nation before there was a Benitez Nation because there never was an Osis Nation. Now, would you accept if we do accept you in, but we continue to keep the Osis Nation name? That's fine. You could call us what you will because we're in your nation. <laughs> Atta boy. Yeah. But Listen, I, I can't tell you enough how honored I am that you're here. I know you're busy, man. I know yeah. you have like... 25 different jobs yeah <laughs> like I, I heard you like you're at miami dade i i, I you're teach here. at miami dade i mean yeah. you're like you're 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 with the monks and the shaolin monks in in china <laughs> i mean you're you're helping out all these you know you're you're the, the Cal, you're working in calcutta helping all the uh, all the wonderful people you know i know you're you're very busy i, I can't thank you enough uh, you and i have been friends way before that Actually, when I first got here, one, you're one of the first people that came up to me and said, hey, man, you're going to like it here. Yeah. You're all right. And it made me feel comfortable because I didn't know what to expect. Right, I, I right. Had been, I had been a little LaSalle cocoon for 15 years. And, and, and you should have. And coming from there, I came in here gun shy. Did you? Cause I did because I really, when I left there, one of the things they told me was you're never going to make it at Columbus. They're going wow. to eat you alive. 
Oh, who's, uh, that's not nice. Well, I mean, and look, I don't think it was meant in a, in a mean way. I think she was concerned that they, I was going to actually be eaten alive, but apparently I'm more than a bite-sized morsel, uh, and absolutely. it was hard to chew on me here. Oh, are you kidding? But And it's worked out. It's worked kids out. Kids love you. Yeah, it's worked, and, and I love them. It's worked out in a good way. We have kids here in the class. That I go, well, I'm part of Osa's nation. The other kids go, oh, how can you be part of Osa's right, nation? Right. You're part of Benita's nation. Right. And they're like, and they're like, well, I can't, I can't, sorry, I'm part of Osa's And I'm like, of course, you could be both, man. It's all right. right. Well, I'm gonna put your sticker is gonna go on my board. <laughs> so it's going to it's going to start to erase these ideas <laughs> that there's a com that there is no competition, which you've done with your with your group of people. The podcast alone, the stickers, the mentality, the kids walking around having pride. That's not something I've seen in college prep since the days of when college prep was right. called phase two and there was pride in it. Well, that, that's for me, that's the main thing. The main thing is I'm not trying to reach the athlete in the classroom. That guy already has uh, confidence. That guy already ha doesn't need any more, uh, you know, pat in the box. Those guys get plenty. I'm trying to reach that that kid that doesn't want to talk. Right. The one that doesn't, wants to be shy. He's shy. He doesn't want, that's the guy I'm trying to reach. That's the guy I'm always trying to reach. And he's the one that has a sticker. Yeah. And he's the so, one that's, that takes great pride in yeah. it. So I, I, I really, uh, I, I do this because they want it. And it's not because the administration wants it or I want it. Uh, I do it for the kids. Yeah. I think you and I agree. It's all about these kids. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I've never seen. I've been. I've been teaching for twenty something years now. I've never seen a, spe a better, more special group of kids in this school. I, I really, really think what there is here, what's going on here, is magical between the faculty and the, and the students and the administration. I mean, it, it's it is a weld oil machine. We've had our we've had our rough times uh, yeah. the last couple of years, uh, you know, whatever for whatever reason. Right. We've had people all of a sudden. We've had cameras outside, right. this and that. But we just go steady. It's like a train it, that just keeps going. It, it's a it keeps. It's as though the world around us will go crazy, but the world in here stays the same. Yeah. It, this, it this, just it keeps flowing. I, I and I think it's one of the reasons it's guys like you, man. I, I really, I, I think what you're doing with the kids, the way the kids love you, they respect you, uh, the way the faculty all, you know, care for you. And I, I mean, when I told some people today, oh, I'm going to take OSIS. Oh, you're bringing OSIS in? <laughs> I mean, teachers. This yeah. weren't even students. Really? They were like, oh, you're going to bring OSIS in? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm going to bring him in. And they were like, oh, that's a good podcast. Because, you know, I had Harriman here. And, yeah. and Harriman scared the bejesus out of me. Because Harriman's all over the place. Yeah. Harriman speaks about like World War II, and then the next sentence he talks about sex in the city. And it was like, oh, wait. And I was trying to like reel him in. I was like, no, no, wait. You know, come, come back in. You know, you, if you ever hear the podcast, it's hilarious. Yeah. And I didn't hear, I heard Linsky's. I've heard like three of them. Yeah. Because I, I was listening to them as, as a fan. This will be your fourth. As you know? a fan. I, I don't listen. Well, I mean, I heard all this ones, but as a fan, I, I was like, I, when they met, when the kids mentioned to me you were doing this, I was like, I got to hear what this is. And from the intro music, I was hooked. I was like, oh, oh man, yeah, I'm totally man. in. I'm yeah, totally the in. The music totally is in. awesome. So anyway, I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I, I, um, I, I think it's going to be one of the best podcasts I've ever had. Well, good. I, and I think a lot of kids are going to listen to it because uh, this you're so popular with the kids. And I think uh, putting us both together here is a good thing, you know. So. Is this the part where you say like and subscribe or something? I don't no, know. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even ask. They do it on their own. But uh, yeah, I, I, no. And, and, and I used to actually when we first started, we used to have like um, we used to have like commercials, like we had made up commercials <laughs> that we would say like like McKeon's Burgers. Uh, you know what is it? It was uh, uh what is it? It was. Uh, um, yeah, it was like soft and juicy on the inside, Hard, you know, strong on the outside, soft and juicy on the inside. We would make all kind of fun. Oh, oh Brian meatballs. Yes. And salty balls in and around your mouth. <laughs> like, <laughs> we might have to cut that out. <laughs> and we have a, we have Marinelli's Italian restaurants, oh, you yeah, know, good, fun food and, and impersonations. Yeah. All right. And we had, and Coomer's, uh, Coomer's tutoring, uh, or it said it was like uh, intelligence and big biceps all together. Oh, wow, all right. <laughs> that Work was, out what you what you learned. So again, man, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for coming here. Uh, 
And I hope you come back. I will. No, we'll I do this again. This All was right, fun. Bro. All right. Listen, Benitez Nation, there you got Osis Nation. That's the man. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud to have him here. Uh, we really have gone somewhere, Gabe. We, we've gone somewhere. We're going up the world because we're bringing in some of the big dogs out here. All right. So, again, uh, Benitez Nation, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, we'll see each other soon. Dale peace.